We now begin to look at the five requirement areas of a battery management system in more detail. For the remainder of this week, our focus is going to be on requirement number one, which is sensing and high voltage control. In this lesson, we're going to consider how to measure cell voltage. In a lithium ion battery pack, it's absolutely critical to measure every single cell's voltage. The difference in voltage between cells is an indicator of their relative balance and an indicator of how much they require equalization. And you will learn more about that in the fifth course in the specialization. Measurements of voltage are also required inputs to most state of charge and state of health estimation algorithms. And further, for safety purposes, it's critical that we know the voltage of every cell. Even if the voltage of a battery pack is within acceptable limits, it's possible for the voltage of individual cells to be outside of acceptable limits. And if I were to overcharge a lithium ion battery cell by mistake, that can lead to thermal runaway as shown in the picture to the right. Thermal runaway happens when heat builds up in a cell, which causes the separator to melt, which further causes an internal short circuit that leads to further heat buildup, and this reaction becomes self-sustaining. So in order to guarantee or ensure that we're not overcharging individual cells, we must know the voltage of every cell, and we cannot skip measuring any voltages in a lithium ion battery pack. So how do we actually measure these voltages? At the most basic level, voltage is measured using a circuit that's known as an analog to digital converter. This technology has a number of commonly seen abbreviations such as ADC or A slash D or A2D or A dash 2 dash D spelled out. An analog to digital converter samples the voltage level at its input and it converts that voltage level into a binary pattern of ones and zeros inside of a special purpose integrated circuit or inside of a microcontroller having a built-in ADC. The binary pattern is a digital representation of the voltage that it's measuring. There are several common analog to digital conversion architectures. One is known as a direct conversion or a flash technology. Electronically, this converter uses a bank of comparator circuits that detect whether the input voltage uh, is above or below some internally regulated fixed voltage. So overall, this collection of comparators is used to determine and output the code corresponding to the voltage that's closest to um, any one of these comparator circuits. This technology is the fastest of all the ADC methods, and it's essentially instantaneous, but it's also the most expensive to implement because of the number of comparators and the number of fixed reference voltages that must be built inside of the converter. The second method for analog to digital conversion relies internally on really the opposite technology, a digital to analog converter. It turns out that it's relatively simple to build a digital to analog converter using some common components, uh, some resistors and an operational amplifier. Uh, there may be better approaches than that, but the main point is that it's simple to build a digital to analog controller, whereas it's more complicated to build an analog to digital converter. So the second analog to digital conversion approach guesses at what the voltage might be and then outputs a voltage corresponding to that guess using its digital to analog converter. It then uses a single comparator to see whether the voltage produced by the guess is above or below the, the voltage at the input that it's trying to measure. And by successive approximation, it keeps on this higher, lower guessing until it gets close enough uh, to an estimate of the voltage it's trying to measure. This is a somewhat slow approach because of the need to repeatedly make these guesses, but it's also a very inexpensive approach to implement. The third approach is relatively modern and is adopted in many, many applications. It's known as a sigma delta or sometimes as a delta sigma approach. The method is somewhat similar to the successive approximation approach in that it guesses what the voltage is and produces a voltage at its output corresponding to that guess. Uh, 
and then it uses a 1-bit flash analog to digital converter which requires only a single comparator to encode that difference between the approximation and the input it's trying to measure. Usually the Delta Sigma approach uses very fast sampling in order to come up with uh, sums and differences of the 1-bit ADC in order to very quickly approximate the input signal. So it success successively approximates using a flash ADC at a very fast sample rate and it's a very popular approach. Regardless of the method used for the ADC, each of these is usually implemented in a specialized integrated circuit, or IC, because of the need to precisely match all of the resistances and capacitances and all of the components involved in making the circuit. And it's easier to match these components on side of an integrated circuit than it is using discrete components in an externally built circuit. It's also common practice to include analog to digital converters built into many microcontrollers. So battery management systems for small battery packs may not need any external circuitry outside of the microcontroller itself for voltage measurement. When you're designing a battery management system and you must select an analog to digital converter for your design, there are several criteria that you must be aware of. The first that we will talk about is the resolution of the converter. The resolution of an analog to digital converter is the smallest change in the input signal that can be measured. It's the step size between consecutive converter output codes in voltage. So consider an analog to digital converter that has m bits at its output. That means it has 2 to the power m output codes. If these codes happen to be distributed evenly over the entire input range, as is most common, then the range of input from the lowest voltage you can measure to the highest voltage you can measure we will call EFSR, where FSR means full scale range. If all of these are evenly distributed, then the resolution is the full scale voltage difference divided by 2 to the power m. For example, let's consider a converter that has input range from 0 volts to 5 volts. Suppose this converter also has 16 bits of precision such that M equals 16. Then the resolution of the converter, which we will call Q, is computed as Q equals 5 volts minus 0 volts, all divided by 2 to the power 16. The answer to this computation is 76 microvolts. The values I use in this example are typical of the better analog to digital converters presently available for battery management systems. So a resolution of 76 microvolts is a common value. Uh, the plot on the right illustrates this input-output relationship of an analog to digital converter. On the horizontal axis you see the actual input voltage that's been normalized by subtracting the minimum voltage of the converter and by um, dividing by the full scale range of the converter. So that maps the minimum voltage to 0 and the maximum voltage to 1 on this axis. In this example we're considering a converter that has three output bits or m equals 3. So there are 2 to the m or 8 possible distinct output codes ranging from 0, 0, 0 all the way up to 1, 1, 1 in binary and these are shown on the vertical axis. The blue line on the graph shows how the input voltage is converted into an output code. The input range is generally divided into 8 regions and the converter rounds the input voltage to the closest voltage uh, that is represented by an output code. So slightly negative inputs all the way up to slightly positive inputs get rounded to an output code of 0, 0, 0. And inputs that are a little larger than that get rounded to the code 0, 0, 1 and so forth. And this continues all the way up to the maximum measured voltage. And voltage inputs slightly smaller than the maximum value up to slightly larger to the maximum value are rounded to the output code 1, 1, 1. The input voltage distance between any one of these output codes is the resolution of the converter. So the output code changes any time the input changes by this resolution voltage. So we could say that the smallest change in output corresponds to a single bit change in the least significant bit position of the output. So the resolution of an analog to digital converter is often called the LSB voltage, which stands for the least significant bit voltage of the converter.
Another important consideration when choosing an ADC is its accuracy. Its accuracy has to do with the absolute difference between the reported value of voltage and the true value of voltage. And differences might arise due to several causes. One is due to the inaccuracy of quantization that we saw on the previous slide, the rounding to the nearest output code. This means that there is an unmeasurable part of the true voltage, and that unmeasurable part has magnitude that is less than one half of this resolution. Uh, the figure on the right illustrates this quantization error. Um, there is a signal plotted versus time, so the horizontal axis is time, the vertical axis is value in the top plot. Uh, in the top plot, the blue line is the input voltage signal, and the red stair step line corresponds to the voltage codes that are reported by the analog to digital converter. And you can see that the blue line has been rounded in every case to the closest voltage code that is available to the converter. But this rounding does not produce a perfectly accurate result. There's some difference between the quantized signal and the actual input signal. And this difference is called quantization error, and it is drawn in the plot on the bottom. So again, the horizontal axis is time, and the vertical axis now is the quantization error voltage. In this example, the analog to digital converter uh, resolution Q is equal to 1 volt, and so the quantization error is limited to values between plus and minus 1 half of a volt. A second source of inaccuracy in a converter is known as offset error. Offset is a constant difference, a constant bias between the ideal measured value and the reported measured value that spans the entire measurement range of the converter. Uh, offset errors can be caused by biases in the electronics, either internal or external, to the converter. A third source of inaccuracy of the converter is gain error. In the previous slide, we saw the input-output relationship of an ideal conversion process. If the actual conversion process has different slope from what we've seen in this ideal case, that means that there is a gain error in the conversion. And this gain error is usually expressed as a percent. Finally, the converter might have a nonlinear error. This is any departure from the actual and the ideal step widths in the conversion and is often expressed in the number of analog to digital converter counts that are the worst case differences. There are several other considerations that we must uh, take into account when we select an analog to digital converter. One is the effect of temperature. The offset and gain and nonlinear errors that we talked about on the previous slide are all functions of temperature, and we must ensure that our solution provides acceptable performance within the entire range of temperature expected in the application. A second consideration is called timing jitter. Timing jitter is when the absolute time difference between samples made by the converter is not exactly constant. In the second course of the specialization, when we look at more detail on how we make models of lithium-ion battery cells, you will learn that we assume that there's a constant, an exactly constant, timing between samples we make. Uh, these models will degrade in accuracy whenever the timing is not, in fact, constant, and so we will have some specification on the maximum timing jitter that we will permit in our converter. A third consideration when we're designing using an analog to digital converter is related to something called aliasing. This is not so much a function of the converter itself as it is a function of the fact that we're looking at a continuous time signal at only snapshots at discrete points in time and not at every single possible point in time. In control theory and signal processing theory, there is something known as the Nyquist sampling theorem that states that the sample rate of your conversion process must be at least twice the highest frequency found in the input signal. If we do not meet this criteria, then high frequency inputs actually turn out to look like low frequency inputs after they're sampled. The drawing on the slide illustrates this. Uh, I draw a blue sinusoidal signal versus time. This uh, sinusoidal signal has a frequency of 5 Hertz. If we sample the signal very quickly, then we will be able to reproduce this 5 Hz signal with very high fidelity. 
The Nyquist sampling theory says that the minimum rate at which we can sample the signal if we want to reconstruct it perfectly is 10 Hertz. If we sample more slowly than 10 Hertz, then we have a problem. The yellow boxes on this diagram show what happens if we sample the signal at 7 Hertz instead. And you can see that these yellow boxes correspond exactly to points on that blue signal sampled at a 7 Hertz rate. We don't get enough samples per period if we sample this slowly, though, to be able to state with assurance that the input signal is 5 Hertz. In fact, it looks to us as if the input signal might be 2 Hertz instead. You see the red dotted line on this graph is a 2 Hertz sinusoid, and it passes exactly through the same yellow markers that were created by sampling the 5 Hertz signal. So therefore, the actual 5 Hertz signal is masquerading in our samples as a 2 Hertz signal. It's aliasing as a 2 Hertz signal, and that's why we call this phenomenon aliasing. One factor we have to our advantage when we're designing a sample rate is that battery cells have long time constants and they're quite slow devices. And that means that we usually don't need to sample the input voltages at a very high rate due to the dynamics of the battery cells themselves. However, it might be more important to sample the input voltage quickly if the external load has some very fast time constants. In an automotive application, for example, the battery pack is connected to a device called an inverter that drives the motor. And the inverter has power electronics inside of it that often have switching frequencies in the tens of kilohertz. And this switching can cause noise at those frequencies on this measured battery voltage. So by sampling more quickly than the battery dynamics themselves might dictate we need to, our algorithms for battery management may be able to help mitigate the effects of noise from the inverter and still provide good estimates of state of charge and state of health and so forth. Because high power battery packs usually comprise many battery cells in series, it's not efficient to use discrete analog to digital components to measure all of the voltages in all of the cells. Instead, different manufacturers have created integrated circuits or chipsets for the specific purpose of aiding high voltage battery management system design. These relatively low cost measurement chips are used in modules or slave units close to the battery cells. And these measurement chips do not have any significant processing on board. Instead, they make the voltage measurements and they transmit those voltage measurements to a master unit and the master unit does all of the processing for state of charge and state of health estimation and so forth. An advantage to delegating this analog to digital conversion task to specialized chipsets is that the integrated circuits can then be designed to implement the very difficult task of highly accurate voltage sensing with high common mode rejection, with fast response in environments that often have high electromagnetic interference or EMI, perhaps even high heat and high vibration. These chips are also often designed so that they can be placed in parallel for redundant and fault tolerant designs. If different chips that are expected to provide exactly the same voltage measurement in fact produce quite different voltage measurements, then we can conclude that at least one of these chips is faulty. The master unit can then inform the application that there is a fault in the battery management electronics that must be investigated and repaired. There are a number of vendors that make chipsets to perform these voltage measurements, and some examples are analog devices and Maxim and Texas Instruments. In order to illustrate some common functionality of these chipsets, I've chosen to talk about the LTC 6811 part. This part was originally designed by Linear Technology Corporation, and hence the LTC. But Linear Technology was acquired by Analog Devices, and so this part is now being marketed through Analog Devices. Each of the integrated circuits, each of the 6811 parts, is capable of monitoring up to 12 cells in series in a module. And then multiples of this chipset can be placed in series in a daisy chain slave architecture so that overall hundreds of cells in series in a battery pack can be monitored. In order to facilitate the connection of measurements from one slave to another, this chip has built-in isolated electronics for communication between the parts. That's also very highly noise immune, 
that allows for very robust communication and noisy environments. This chip also supports both internal and external cell equalization circuitry, either using passive balancing or connected to an active balancing solution that is also marketed through analog devices. The chipset can be powered by the battery module itself, meaning that we don't require an external power source in order to make it function, and that can be a huge advantage. And finally, this chipset is able to measure up to five temperatures directly. It can also be configured with some external circuitry to measure more temperatures than that if that's what's required. The illustration on the slide shows a block diagram of the components internal to the 6811 chip. Everything in the orange box corresponds to electronics inside of the chip, and external to the component on the left we see the individual battery cells in series. The resistors and transistors drawn external to the 6811 are for balancing. The transistors inside the 6811 that connect to these external circuits control the balancers. The external cell voltages are connected internally to two different multiplexers, analog multiplexers, and each one of these multiplexers is connected to a single sigma delta analog to digital converter. Uh, the 12 cells in the battery module then have their voltages measured two at a time in parallel, one voltage per multiplexer per converter. Therefore, after six conversion cycles, all of the cell voltages are measured. The other circuitry that's drawn on this diagram to the top, top of the 6811 has to do with communication across the isolated daisy chain mechanism between one component and another. Circuitry drawn on the bottom is used for interfacing with some general purpose analog to digital inputs and outputs that can be controlled by the master BMS to measure temperatures or communicate with memories or any other number of functions. The example I presented on the previous slide considers a component available through analog devices, but there are other components available on the market. And so how should you choose which component to use in your application? Uh, on this slide, I present a few ideas for you to think about when you're making that decision. First, you need to consider how many cells are wired in series in your battery pack. And then you need to compare that against how many cells each integrated circuit from each silicon vendor is able to monitor. If your pack has a lot of cells in series, there can be advantages to choosing a chip that can monitor a lot of cell voltages at the same time. Another consideration is how many cells in total can be monitored using however many number of chips. The example I showed you is for the 6811 part that allows daisy chaining of individual monitoring chips in series that you can monitor in total hundreds of battery cell voltages. But not every solution from every vendor allows for this. So you need to select a solution that's able to monitor all of the voltages that you require for your battery pack design. A third consideration is whether the chipset supports balancing. It's extremely helpful if you're able to control balancing for individual cells using this chipset instead of having to create additional electronics of your own to do so. Of course, the chipset must have the measurement accuracy that meets the needs of the algorithms you plan to implement in your battery management system, you must also be able to measure a sufficient number of temperatures for inputs to the battery management system algorithms. In order to minimize overall system cost, you may need to minimize the number of wires that are needed to communicate from one integrated circuit to another in between different slave units in the master BMS. And this might seem silly to you if you haven't performed this design before, but wires turn out to be quite expensive and connectors between different parts in a battery management system further turn out to be quite expensive. And so minimizing the number of wires is a pretty significant concern. Finally, it's important to confirm that this chipset that you've selected is actually available. And what is the cost of the solution per cell in your design? And this might also seem like a silly consideration to you, but it in my experience, in the past at least, there have been a number of silicon vendors that have announced products, and these products never actually made it to market and were never actually available. So it's important that you talk with a vendor to ensure that the quantity of components that you need will be available to you in a reasonable time. So in summary in this lesson, you've learned that all battery cell voltages in a lithium-ion battery pack must be monitored continuously during operation.
This is done using an analog to digital converter, which is generally built into a special purpose integrated circuit that performs this function. When selecting an analog to digital converter, you must consider the resolution and the accuracy to ensure that both of these meet your design requirements. In order to monitor large battery packs, silicon vendors have produced specialized chipsets to perform all of the functions required. I showed you an example of one of these chipsets, the LTC6811, and you learned some general criteria to consider when selecting a chipset for your own design. And that concludes this particular topic on voltage measurement. The next thing that we're going to look at is how do we measure other quantities in a battery pack for our battery management algorithms.